We have a historical timeline that contributes to the developing the theory of evolution. And there are uh, some scientists that I'm going to bring up. I'm only going to talk about these four, George Cuvier, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, Thomas Malthus, and Charles Darwin. There are others, most certainly others, that contribute to this theory of evolution. These are the four that I'm going to talk about. George Cuvier, he developed the science of paleontology. Paleontology is the study of fossils. So he, this handsome man right here is George Cuvier, he developed uh, this idea that fossils contribute to evidence and observations. Discovering that organisms found in lower layers, so here's an image here, and I have different layers of, let's say, Earth. In the lower layers of this earth portion that I'm showing you, the fossils, let's say in layer B right here, A, we didn't find any fossils, and B, there are some fossils, I can see some fossils here, trapped within layer B. Well, these fossils in layer B are more dissimilar to the fossils that I'm gonna find in more um, superficial layers. So for instance, let me go ahead and look at the fossils in D. The fossils in D are going to be more related to the current organisms that exist today than the fossils in B. These are more archaic. They are going to be um, a distant relative to these more superficial layers. Here in layer F, I can actually see some fossils. There's some imprints. I can see this fossil right here it looks like a dragonfly. These fossils are going to be closely related to our current organisms on Earth compared to deeper layers of Earth. So George Cuvier gave us this concept. The next contribution George Cuvier made was saying that new species, since he looked at all these fossils, he discovered that new species appeared while others disappeared. So if you can appreciate that all these different fossils here, he would kind of see this shell squiggly guy in layer B. It looks like we still find the shell squiggly guy in layer C, so many years later. But if we look at this organism right here, it's kind of long, uh, tail-like thing here with these uh, appendages sticking out, I don't really see that fossil in any other layer. So he gave us that concept that new species appeared um, along the timeline and others disappeared, like this guy right here. And all of a sudden I see this species appearing, whereas it didn't appear in other layers. That's quite interesting. To go over what a fossil is, very briefly, uh, fossils are imprints or remains of organisms that lived in the past. Uh, paleontologists are the scientists that are studying fossils. So here we can see a couple of different examples of fossils. Uh, the soft parts of dead organisms, they usually decay rapidly. And so it's the hard parts of organisms, think of bone or anything kind of rich in mineral that are going to remain as fossils, usually. Um, not all fossils have to be the remains. So here I can actually see an entire organism, this is an insect, embedded in amber. The amber itself has hardened it and kept it um, from the elements over 45 million years and has kept that organism intact. That's a fossil right there. Um, other uh, kinds of fossils that aren't the actual organism itself, right here I can actually see something known as imprints. Think of an imprint as a footprint or a burrow. So the organism itself is long gone, but these are actually remaining after many years, signifying uh, that that organism was there at that time. Casts can form when dead, buried organisms decompose. They leave an empty mold that's later filled by minerals. This is called a cast. I can actually see a nice uh, image of a cast right here where that empty space was filled with minerals in this tree. Um, what else? Here's a 40,000 year old baby mammoth found frozen. So the entire organism itself was kept intact due to that weather, that frozen uh, area of Northern Russia. 
And this is a fossil that scientists can study today. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck is a scientist in the early 1800s that gave a huge backbone for Darwin to then develop his theories off of. And so Jean-Baptiste suggested that life evolves by habitual use and disuse of a feature. So what does that mean? What that means is that excessive use of something, well, that organism is going to grow and develop whatever they're using the most out of. If they don't use something, that organism, that will eventually atrophy. That just means break down. So what does that mean? Here I have an image, and here's a giraffe, a happy giraffe, and that giraffe wants to get food from a tree. Well, to reach the tree, it looks like we're using a palm tree here for this image, to reach the tree, it looks like that giraffe is going to use its neck to reach high locations for food sources. And then that neck over time grows larger to the point where giraffes today have an extremely long neck in order to reach that food source. So they're using the neck more, stretching it out. Excessive use will grow and develop it. The neck of a giraffe, for instance, for Jean-Baptiste. So basically, he's describing that this concept of evolution as a refinement of traits. Basically, what traits are going to get used more than others? So you're refining the traits that you actually do want to use in your lifetime. And whatever traits you're refining, you're going to equip that organism to be more successful in their environment, like the neck of this draft. And over time, that individual is going to pass on those traits to the offspring. So this draft, over time, over his or her lifetime, if that neck becomes larger, then the offspring will inherit that use of that trait, a larger neck. Okay, he was on to something. Jean-Baptiste was definitely on to something. But I do have to say that this is incorrect. This is not how organisms are in real life. If I consistently work out in my life and gain high muscle mass, that doesn't mean that my offspring is automatically going to gain lots of muscle mass. So Jean-Baptiste's theory, though going the right direction, isn't exactly hitting it on the mark. So now enter Thomas Malthus, and Thomas Malthus is an economist, um, not necessarily a scientist, contributing to the theory of evolution like um, Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck did, but still very important. Um, and I consider economists scientists, absolutely, um, but who paved the way um, for Darwin to develop his uh, and refine his ideas about evolution. So Thomas Malthus wrote the essay on the principle of population. Basically, the key point of this essay was that plant and animal populations grow faster than their food supply. Uh, and if they do, they eventually, the population is reduced by starvation, disease, other factors. So there's kind of a limit that the population can get to as far as resources are concerned in their territory. And when there is an abundance of food supply, the population will grow faster. But eventually there's a limit that's, re that's reached. Um, so in his essay, amongst other things in this essay, that's a key point. So Darwin read this essay uh, in 1798, and he used it to refine his own ideas on evolution. So now enter Charles Darwin, um, the father of evolution. So this is the mid-1800s. He combined Lamarckian ideas, so that refinement of traits that we just discussed, as well as recent fossil discoveries to develop the theory of evolution. And what I'm going to teach you today, what we know today, is a lot of it is coming from Darwin's ideas and thoughts. Basically, to sum up, he proposed that species living today changed over time from ancestors. So they had ancestors that resembled them in some way, um, and they changed over time. Traits better suited to conditions would have an advantage and be more likely to 
develop in their offspring. So will be more likely to reproduce, um, to reach sexual maturity and to reproduce with another organism and leave offspring. This is called natural selection. And natural selection basically led in lots of diverse modifications. Uh, Darwin coined these evolutionary adaptations that I'm gonna teach you um, that basically made these organisms fit in their environment. So let's use those giraffes having long necks to reach their food source as an example. So for Darwin, he kind of developed on Lamarckian idea saying, okay, there's a, uh, a selection pressure that's being used for a certain trait in an environment. And so here for these drafts, in order to reach their food source, which is located in a high spot, longer necks are going to be better to reach that food source than shorter necks. So remember that Lamarck said that neck was going to grow larger and larger and larger over time because that draft was using that neck more. Well, now here's Darwin entering that says, okay, drafts that have a longer neck are better suited in their environment and they're going to have an adaptive advantage over giraffes with shorter necks. And that is the case that where giraffes with shorter necks just won't be likely to survive and gather that food source as these giraffes over here with the longer neck. So here's this guy that outlived this guy. Well now this guy is going to go on and go ahead and have the advantage of reproducing. This guy didn't maybe didn't make it to sexual maturity, but this guy did. He's going to be able to reproduce and make offspring. Those offspring will probably have longer necks based on the rules of Mendelian inheritance that we learned.